So we're picking up today, Your Adversary, the Devil, uh, Part 4. I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 6. I'm only going to do a couple of verses here, and then we're going to be reading uh, several other passages of Scripture as we move along. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Paul is saying, this is my final word here to you, Ephesians. This is it. This is, I'm going to bring it all in right here. Finally, the final word is to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. I want, I want you to remember now what Ephesus was like. Ephesus was the center of evil and wicked, diabolical sin. It was witchcraft and demonology and everything else was going on in the small port city of Ephesus, which now, years, thousands of years later, sits probably two miles away from the, the sea. But it was a vital area, and it was the headquarters, remember, of the Church of Jesus Christ in Asia Minor, of which Paul worked from, and the gospel was spread throughout Asia Minor, from Ephesus. And so this church understood difficult times. They understood oppression from the enemy. It says here, he's saying, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might, in the power of His might. That's encouraging, isn't it? That's encouraging words to the church. It, it was then and it is today. It's God's word for you today as well. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in Jesus Christ. Be strong in His divine power, in His might that you have been filled with. Because you are not your own. You've been bought with a price because the Spirit of God dwells in you, the divine power of God. You have the strength within you to be strong in Jesus Christ. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We've been talking about the schemes, haven't we, over the past three messages. The schemes of the devil. 2 Corinthians 2.11, it tells us that Paul is encouraging the church to, to now forgive and restore a brother who was in sin, who had been set outside the church. And he was saying, now it's time to forgive him, it's time to bring him back, and it's time to restore him, lest we be outwitted by Satan. Because we are not ignorant of his schemes. You, my dear brothers and sisters, should never be ignorant of the schemes of the enemy. And yet we could all probably testify this week of a trap we fell into. Maybe we said something about someone we shouldn't have. Maybe we gossiped. Maybe, maybe we, we just were out of line in something we did. Or, or places we may have gone. Things we let our eyes see. Or things that we may have thought upon. And you caught yourself after, after a time and thinking, oh, no, no, this isn't right. He says, be strong in the Lord, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, this Wickedness, he's talking about, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places. Oh, God's blessing, God's word is anointed. We need not ask for God to anoint his word. However, we need to ask for the Lord to anoint his vessel of communication. That would be me. And receptive hearts, vessels of clay. We ask you, Lord Jesus, these things. John Stott says a thorough knowledge of the enemy and a healthy respect for his prowess are a necessary prelim preliminary to victory in war. Similarly, he goes on to say, if we underestimate our spiritual enemy, we shall see no need for God's armor. We shall go out to the battle unarmed with no weapons but our own puny strength. and We shall be quickly and ignominiously defeated meaning we shall be quickly put to open shame because we failed to understand the battle. We failed to understand the enemy. I left off last week talking about the invisible war. The, the invisible world is just as real as the visible world we are in today. This reality that we live in 
There is another reality. There is a supernatural reality that we cannot see. This is our visible reality. This life. And don't we enjoy this life? We enjoy, we understand this life through the five senses, don't we? That's what makes it reality. However, we can't take these physical uh, characteristics of our makeup and, and engage in a spiritual warfare. The, the invisible world is just as real as the world that you are sitting in today, that you are a part of. And we went back to 2 Kings chapter 6, if you want to go there with me. 2 Kings chapter 6, I'm not going to read the whole thing like I did last week. Elisha's servant thought that they were in peril. The king of Syria was after Elisha uh, because every time he made a plan to attack Samaria and other parts of Israel, God would inform Elisha of his plans and, and he would make it known, Elisha would make it known to the king of Samaria so that they were always prepared. And the, the king of Syria, he felt like some of his own men were deceiving him, betraying him, and going to Elijah. Well, they found Elijah. And now the king of Syria set out his army to go to Elijah, to go take him in the city of Dothan. And they got up one morning, verse 15, in 2 Kings chapter 6, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He's, he's in a panic here. Picture this guy. He goes out to get the coffee going, and he looks, and the city is completely surrounded by horses, chariots, and footmen from the Syrian army. And he quickly goes back to Elisha, He's, he's in a panic. He, his, his adrenaline is running. Alas, Master, he says, what shall we do? What shall we do? How many of you ever asked that question in the situations that you find yourself in? Or the circumstances or trials that God brings your way? What shall I do? What, what can I do? And we, we, we try to navigate so much of circumstance and trials in the physical realm. And hopefully and prayerfully... God brings us to the place where we realize there's another answer here. There's another approach here. There's another perspective here that transcends the physical into the spiritual. And this is what Elijah says. Do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Amen. Then Elijah prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Hey. Wow, what a wonderful picture we get of this scene. Church, maybe you're in the place of this servant, and you don't know what to do, and we need to pray, you need to pray that the Lord would open your eyes to the truth of God's word that we have in front of us. That the enemy is not going to win. The enemy is not going to be victorious. You may be outnumbered. You may feel overwhelmed in the battle. And you may think that there's no hope whatsoever. But you need to get your focus on the cross of Jesus Christ, for therein lies the victory, always and eternally, for the child of God. Hallelujah. Well, that doesn't change my situation. Oh, but it does. It does. It will have an impact and effect upon your life and the lives of the people around you. When we grasp hold of this truth, pray, oh Lord, open our eyes. I pray many times when I come to the pulpit and uh, to preach God's word, I pray that, Lord, open our eyes, illumine our hearts to understand what your word says. And God gives us that truth. God imprints that truth. He will do what I can never do. Because he's God and it's his word. It's his word, and it's a powerful word. We find over in Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10. Hmm. Daniel 
set his face toward the east. He was determined to pray and to seek God. And man, God intervened from the invisible realm. You see, Elijah prayed that his, the eyes of his servants would be, servant would be open to the invisible realm. Now Daniel is, Daniel is going to have an encounter from the invisible realm. It says here in verse 10, I'd like to read the whole chapter, but I don't really have time for that. To, I would lose the point here. Verse 10, an angel of the Lord has appeared to Daniel. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. You got that picture? He's on his hands and knees and he's trembling before this awesome vision, this, this visitation that he has. And he said to me, oh, Daniel. Now listen to what he says to Daniel. Man greatly loved. Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. He's talking about a battle going on in the heavenly realm that he encountered this angel. That Michael, the archangel, came to his assistance. He was fighting against the kings of Persia. He wasn't fighting against flesh and blood here. There was a king of Persia. That is not what is going on here. This is in the heavenly realms. This is in the spiritual realm. This is in the unseen realm that is going on. And, and he comes to Daniel. He says to Daniel, since the moment you determined to pray, you set your heart to prayer, God heard your words and I was sent. But I was delayed for 21 days because he was in a spiritual warfare. The darkness and the evil was trying to prevent him from getting to Daniel. But let me tell you something here, and you know this well. Nothing, nothing can stop the hand of God in your life, period. Amen. Nothing Amen. can. But we oftentimes forfeit and miss that because we are not focused in the right battle. Amen. He says in verse 14, And I came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. <laughs> and it goes on to say how he strengthened Daniel. He touched Daniel. He strengthened Daniel. Daniel stood before him. He received the word. Oh, church, church, there's something going on that we need to know about. There's something going on beyond what we can see. I had a person tell me years, years ago, I was just a young man, late teens, received a card from them. I was trying to decide what to do with my life, <laughs> searching for the will of God. And I received a card from this lady who was a friend of our family. And I remember in that card, I don't remember everything she said, but I remember one phrase she used, that God will give you the eyes of the dove, meaning the Holy Spirit, to open my eyes to see and to hear God's will. You know, you know that's something God wants you and me to have? He wants you to have that. You say, well, I, I don't see. I, I don't hear. I, I don't feel. I, I. God has made it possible for you to hear and to know His will. Amen. And to what's going on around you. I think we... Oh, there's so much going on that causes us to cast our eyes, our concerns, our emotions, our, our everything in another direction. And we oftentimes miss, not because God has withheld it, not because God doesn't want you to have it, because God is waiting for us to come around to His perspective. You see, God sees the whole picture of your life. We only know right now. We only know it. We can look back over the landscape of our life and, you know, the old saying, 20-20 vision, right? We 
think of some of the mistakes we made, some of the joys, some of the highs and lows in life. But we still, we're still only right here. Oh, but we can make plans. Sure, you go ahead and do that. We can make plans for tomorrow. Things we want to do, things we want to accomplish as goals set. But unless we pray, James tells us, if the Lord wills, we're foolish. Because we don't know anything beyond this moment. God does. God sees the full picture of your life. God sees the full picture of what's going on in your families. God sees the full picture of what's going on in our country and around the world. He sees the full picture of what's going on in Congress. He sees everything that's going on behind closed doors. He knows what's going on. He knows the schemes of the enemy, things that you will never know, you or I will never know. And all he's telling us to do, he's asking us to do, he's saying, stay focused. Stay focused. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And what? The things of this world will grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. But all so many times we want to look like this to Christ. And we miss it. And we miss it. I want to read to you something that I found uh, encouraging. Um, an event that was recorded by a priestly historian back in 70 AD. This is Jewish history, by the way. The writings of Josephus Flavius. In book 6 of chapter 5, he's talking about the incidents that happened just prior to Titus taking, taking Jerusalem and destroying it. And they had had warnings, and, and this is what Josephus is talking about, where Titus himself wanted Josephus to betray the people and to mislead them with information. And Josephus records that. And he also records some happenings that happened in Jerusalem to warn the people that the end is near. Devastation is coming. God has opened up the door for the enemy to come in. But yet the people were missing that. They wouldn't listen. So he says here, Thus there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year. This is recorded actually in other places. Thus also before the Jews' rebellion, he's talking about the rebellion of the Jews to try to hold the city, which they lost. Thus also before the Jews' rebellion and before those commotions which preceded the war, when the people were coming great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the eighth day of the month, Nisan. And at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone around the altar and the holy house, speaking about the temple, that it happened to be bright daytime, which lasted for half an hour. This light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but for the... For but was so interpreted by the sacred scribes as to portend those events that followed immediately upon us. In other words, the foolish people took this as a wonderful sign from God, that God was going to do something good, but the educated scribes knew better, is what he's saying. At the same festival, also a heifer, as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. Moreover, now listen to this, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by twenty men, and rested upon a basis armed with iron, and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was made of one entire stone, was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night." Now those that kept watch in the temple came hereupon running to the captain of the temple and told him, told him of it, who then came up thither and, and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again. <coughs> the gate was opened without man's help after it had been locked. Listen to what he says of this. This also appeared to the vulgar to be a very happy prodigy as if God did thereby open them the gate of happiness. He's opening up the temple, the courts. This is to those who didn't know any better. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord. 
That's a grievous moment for Israel. That's a grievous moment in Jerusalem. It's going to be the fulfillment of God's word against the city. And that gate, and that the gate was open for the advantage of their enemies. It was almost as though God himself opened the gate, is what they're saying, to let the enemy come in. So these publicly declared that this signal foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. Besides these, a few days after that feast, on the 21st day of the month, Jar, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it. And were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of the city. Did you get that? This is recorded by Josephus Flavius, a highly acclaimed priestly historian of that time. He says this, and I'll end with this. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. Let us leave this place now. You say, well, now pastor, that's not the word of God. No, neither is the history of the United States. But it is a recorded history. And these are, this is, according to Josephus, an actual event that happened, that was seen. I'm talking about the invisible realm. You know, God doesn't just abandon his people. God, doesn't, God didn't pour out judgment upon Israel and then just leave. God was in control from beginning to end of the destruction of Israel, of Jerusalem, of the temple. And when Titus came in and many, many Romans were killed, many Roman soldiers were killed before they finally defeated the city. That's all recorded. And then the temple was, was burned completely and it was just demolished, everything. God's word was complete. God was in control. God was in control. When you think of the life of Job, I don't know how many sermons I heard as a young boy in, in my adult years on how righteous Job was and how God allowed Job to be tested and then restored him of everything. Well, let me tell you something about Job. Job had sin in his life. And what Satan designed, designed as a scheme to destroy Job, to get him to curse God, to blame God, God used to reveal to Job that his righteousness was nothing. And Job repented. If you get to the end of the book of Job, uh, Job 39, 40, 41, Job repented. When God says, now you stand up like a man and face me. I've got some questions for you. Can you imagine? <laughs> Where were you when I and he went through creation? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Where did I sink its pillars? <laughs> Job repented. What Satan, at the beginning of Job, we realize, we understand that Satan came into the council of heaven. And he, it seems as though he's tempting God. Oh, but Job serves you for nothing. You touch his life, you take away all of his possessions, he'll curse you. Well, God allowed Satan to do that. Catch that. God allowed Satan to do that. And Job didn't curse God. So there was another time where the sons of God had gathered and Satan comes into the council. And God says to him, what do you think of my servant Job? Is there none like him? Flesh for flesh. Ah, oh, you've taken all that he has, but you touch his flesh. Every man will curse you once you touch their flesh. God said, okay, he's in your hands. Don't take his life. Think about that. Job, Satan touched Job's 
body, his flesh with unbearable pain, boils, that he sat on the ground with a piece of broken shard and scratching himself to get relief. His friends didn't even recognize him. He was so disfigured because of this affliction that God allowed. But you see, Satan, Satan was doing this to get him to sin. God allowed it, not because of a challenge from Satan. He brought it right back upon Satan's lap. He revealed his glory and his forgiveness in the life of Job. Because he constantly referred to Job as Job my servant, Job my servant. In fact, when God turned his attention from Job to his free three friends, God said, you go and you do this and you do that, and you offer this sacrifice, then you come back and Job will pray for you. And I will hear his prayer, but if he does not pray for you, you're in trouble. That's your paraphrase. <laughs> So these three men, they went and did what God told them to do, and Job prayed for them, and God heard his prayer and forgave them. You see, there's an invisible realm all around us. There's things going on that, that we do not fully understand, but we need to be aware of. You see, you think for a moment that you're praying for your loved one, and your loved one has not come to Jesus Christ because they're such a sinner, there's a heavenly warfare going on that's trying to prevent your loved one from coming to Jesus Christ. You don't think that he's using the things of this world to blind people? Intelligence? And, and, and let me footnote this by saying, there's nothing new today that didn't happen years ago. Paul dealt with some very intelligent men at Mars Hill. He dealt with them, and they loved to hear new stuff all the time. They would hear it and study it, think about it, write about it. And Paul goes in and, and he begins to proclaim Jesus to them. And he even quotes one of their own poets to them. So he brought himself in on their level because Paul said, I'm, I am all things to all men. I'm a Jew to the Jew and I'm a Greek to the Greeks. For one purpose, to win Christ. To give them to Christ. You see, you may think that things are going haywire in your life because... Well, you're just a schlep rock. Everything is negative. Everything is a cloud follows you wherever you go. You're not. You just don't have the right focus. You do not have the right focus. Your body may be racked with pain and affliction or someone you know is. What's going on in that? God's doing the work. But are you focused on what God is doing? Does God have your attention yet? See, God got Job's attention. Job was pretty caught up in himself, by the way. Job was pretty caught up in his own integrity. He said, why did you even let me be born? God dealt with that question too, by the way, with Job. You know, Job said, uh, uh, I, my own integrity. It's about my integrity. I, I, I maintained my integrity. And God showed him that he didn't. Because his integrity became his focus. Previously, we identified one scheme of our adversary, and that is to get believers to fight the wrong battle. So many Christians, I'm speaking to the church now, so many Christians are fighting the fleshly battle. They're fighting things physically, and you can't do that. And, and what that means is that Satan wants us to be so intoxicated, intoxicated by the physical realm, that we fight from that perspective. Is it any wonder Peter would say in 1 Peter 1, uh, 5, 8, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. Because the enemy would have you to become intoxicated with the flesh. Amen. With everything around you. Get your eyes focused on the wrong. You've heard people say it. Maybe you've said it yourself. You know, if it wasn't for doing anything wrong, I wouldn't, I'd never do anything. Or if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Well, if that's the way you view life, shame on you. There's no such thing as luck. None. He wants us to focus from that fleshly perspective, and this will lead to constant defeatism in your life. This will leave the Christian feeling overwhelmed, discouraged, confused, weary, doubting. You know, as a Christian, if you're feeling discouraged, or you're feeling weary, 
Or maybe you've had those days, as we all have, I'm sure, where you say, oh, I just don't uh, feel it today. I, you know, I, it's just not. If you do not recognize firsthand, right off the bat, that that's a scheme of the enemy, and you have a long ways to go, you're going to fight a lot of fleshly battles of which you will never win. Never. Tony Evans says if, if Satan can divert your attention away from the spiritual realm, he can keep you away from the only place where your victory is found. That's the truth, isn't it? Because if your eyes are not focused on the Lord Jesus Christ from where your victory rests, then you'll never know his victory. And if the enemy can keep the church blinded and fighting the wrong battles, <laughs> he's going to create disunity in the body. He's going to get you to question. He's going to get you to complain. You know, is it any wonder that churches argue over the color of the carpet <laughs> rather than the doctrine of the church? Huh? Because what's happened? What's happened? Is it any wonder we're called sheep? <laughs> sheep. We're sheep. So Paul tells us here in Ephesians chapter 6, and, and we'll get into this, and um, we're going to be talking about it again later on. He tells us exactly where the battle has taken place. In Ephesians 6.12, he tells us that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but wrestling against rulers, against principalities, authorities, powers, world powers, forces of evil in this present darkness. In, in, in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places. So scripture teaches us that this is not a physical battle. It is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is with the adversary of our soul. Against the rulers, authorities, spiritual forces of evil. Located in the heavenly places. <coughs> heavenly places simply means spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm. Whatever has gone on, whatever is going on, or will go on in your visible, physical world, is rooted in the invisible, spiritual realm. And, and if you do not know how to navigate in the spiritual realm, you cannot hope to truly overcome in the physical realm. You won't do it. You won't do it. Have you ever been around those, those type of Christians? I had a friend of mine years ago that, as a Christian brother, I always felt like I was pumping up a bicycle pump tire with a pump, always trying to encourage him, always trying to make him feel good, uh, edify him to, to feel good about the Lord. He was always so discouraged, always dreary. You ever been around people like that? They'll wear you out. They'll wear you out. You will never ever become victorious when fighting the spiritual battle in the flesh. Our spiritual, our, our battle rather, originates in the spiritual realm, the heavenly places. So the only way to fight this battle is with the weaponry of the spiritual realm. And Paul tells us just how powerful this weaponry is. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. There's a lot being said, and that's powerful weaponry, by the way. Wouldn't you like to get your hands on some of that? Huh? I'd like to pull the trigger on that type of weaponry. It's not in the flesh. It has divine power to destroy strongholds. What's a stronghold? A stronghold can be any sin. And I'm talking about the Christian here. I've, I've seen Christians with strongholds in their life. Yeah. Christians can have a stronghold in their life. You can't just take and say, Lord, forgive me of this stronghold. There's some work that has to be done because you've harbored a sin in your life or a lifestyle for so long that it's built itself up within you. There's a resistance in you. I heard one, one minister, Bible teacher years ago say that, that there's no way that a Christian can just go to the Lord and say, forgive me of this stronghold and it's all over with. There's some work that needs to be done 
in the Word and in prayer to realize that this power that we have living within us. I'm not saying that that Christian is lost. I'm saying they have a stronghold in their life. Paul tells us to, to be rid of our besetting sins. Quickly lay them aside. Get rid of all bitterness and malice, anger, frustrations, resentments. Get rid of them. Because if they take root in your life, they'll be a fortress within your heart. Amen. And you will never live a victorious life as a Christian with strongholds in your heart. This weaponry has divine power. The word divine automatically should tell you what it is. It's the power of God. It's the Holy Spirit in your life. Operating in your life. You being so functioned by the Holy Spirit that you walk in step with it. As Paul says, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Every step you take throughout your day in both the physical and in the spiritual should be in step in alignment with the Spirit of God in you. But like, we, we kind of like to reserve that for Sunday mornings or any other time in church gathering when it's real for a souped up worship time. You know, I'm not criticizing the church there. I'm criticizing you if that's what you do. We, we begin to compartmentalize our relationship with God. We're Christians, but we're real super Christians on Sunday. You know, that's when we really show our stuff. Don't catch me in traffic on Monday. <laughs> and, and this is a consistency church. You can't pick it up and put it down at your leisure. This is something we must live, live, live daily. Because Christ in you, what He's given to you, the hope of glory, you will give an account of what you did with Jesus Christ. We will give an account one day of every idle word the Bible says. Well, first thing I'm going to do is repent for every idle word. Make sure it's under the blood. You see, what he's getting at is the specifics of our life. He's getting at the details of your, your fellowship with Christ and your fellowship with the world, which is prevalent. Do we associate more through the things we think, feel, and do with the world or with Christ? That's a battle. And it's one, I've got some good news for you. You ready? Brace for it. You're going to fight this until you die. Amen. You're going to be in this battle until you die. Or Christ comes. We hope for Christ coming. And it's not over until we are glorified with Him. And praise God, we're going to be glorified with Him someday. <coughs> Imagine heaven. Imagine heaven for just a moment where this battle is going to be over. You're not going to have this battle anymore in heaven. You're not going to have pain anymore in heaven. We're not going to get old and, and lose our eyesight, lose our hearing, lose our taste. Our teeth fall out. Our joints ache. Our muscles ache. We're not going to have those things anymore. And you know what those things are? That's the weight of sin in your life. That's what it is. That's the weight of the curse. From the Garden of Eden, that's the weight of the curse. But in heaven... When we are glorified, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. And the only way to see Him as He is, is to be like Him, John says. It will all be over. This war will be over. No more fighting. No more warfare. No more losing in, our, in and of ourselves because of the sinful nature we fight with every day. It will be over. All we will know is His eternal glory. Church, we need to be encouraged in Him. We need to be encouraged in Jesus Christ. Is your battle hard today? Maybe all of us can look back and think of a few areas that we have lost in and had we known then what we know now. Yeah, we do that, don't we? Look back on our life of 2020 and really it's not. 
You think, oh, I, I'd have made different decisions. Oh, I can't believe I did those things. Uh, or said that. Uh, I can't believe I did that. Well, thank God for grace. Yes, yes. Thank God for grace. And when we are aligned rightly in step with the Word, with the Holy Spirit, there are no regrets. There are no regrets. But we can take our regrets and lay them at the foot of the cross, can we? We can know His forgiveness. We can, we can be cleansed of our sin. And that's the wonderful thing about this, isn't that? We may remember things we've done. People may remember things we've done. But God says, new and holy. New and holy in His Son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Huh? You don't seem a bit excited about that at all. I just heard the angels in heaven whooping it up over that right there. You know, because they, they, they knew nothing of salvation. I think they want to talk with every born-again Christian. What was it like? What was it like to go from death to life? You should be able to tell that story if you know Jesus as your Savior. Amen. He has equipped us. And we're going to get into this more. We're going to get into this more. Um, you can be assured of that. Oh, church, be encouraged in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fight the battle. Put your hands to the plow. Don't look back. Lean into it. And trust Him. He'll see you through this battle. He'll see you through this warfare. And we are assured victory. Amen.